Good morning. Uh, at this time, I would like to uh, release the children to, to join Children's Church. Your leaders are in the back, and we'll take you over there. Thanks for being with us. Nope, that's as high as it goes. Okay. <laughs> well, good morning. My name is Phil Ball. I'm, uh, I'm one of the elders here, and I know Pastor Eric said that last week was the, the last week of, of defining moments, and, and, it's, you know, and he ended with Jesus, so that's a pretty hard act to follow. But um, a couple months back, I, I shared a thought just for my devotions in, in one of our elder meetings, and um, Eric challenged me to, and said, you know, that's, that's a pretty compelling thought. I, I think you should really uh, to build that out a little bit. And, and I, could you preach on September 1st? I was like, okay, yeah. Um, thing is, I was, I was reading in 1 Samuel, and, and I was blown away at the idea of, of Hannah praying so fervently for a son, and then just giving that son up. Um, it struck me as a level of sacrifice that I, I can honestly say I don't think I've ever reached in my life, and, and I could probably gauge that most of us haven't either. Um, but as I read and reread her account, I recognize several defining moments from her life that I believe challenge us as we, as we seek to follow Jesus. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the communion that we just took, a reminder of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And Lord, as I reflect on the life of Hannah and the sacrifices that she made, the way that you used her, her faithfulness in the face of trial, her fervent prayers, and her faith and trust that you would answer, followed by her sacrifice. Lord, I pray that you would help us to glean from this today, Lord, how we can lead a life of sacrifice, much like in, in following the example of what Christ did on the cross. We pray all this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, now, if you were here at Laura Wood in the times that I was a youth pastor, um, you, you probably remember I didn't preach all that often. Um, in fact, I was just thinking today, like, it's probably been about eight or nine years since I last preached here at Laurelwood, uh, so it's been a while. But um, the funny thing is, is this is like the second time in about four weeks that I've had the opportunity to pray, or to, to preach, and I was actually just invited to preach again in a few weeks at another church, but I'm waiting on, waiting to see how this goes before I say yes to that one. Um, <laughs> A couple of weeks ago, I was at Hawkinson Community Church, and I was, I was sharing about forgiveness. Uh, as an example, I, I shared how my brother Stephen and I forgave my dad for uh, just how things went leading up to my parents' divorce and, and even some afterwards. And, and the funny thing is that, um, well, not the funny thing is, but the awesome thing is that there were some ripple effects from our forgiveness towards our father. And, and ultimately, it, it rippled effect to the to a degree that, that my dad and his stepmom were able to adopt my little brother there, Dylan. And, and so, you know, God used that forgiveness. So as I, as I think about this week and, the, and the, what God's laid on my heart here, I thought it only fair that I also look at my mom's example and the sacrifice that she made, highlighting her and how she, she really gave up a lot so that my brother and I could be the men that we are. As I mentioned, my parents divorced when I was eight years old, and my brother, was, my brother Stephen was 11. After a few months, during a, during a court-appointed visit, my brother and my dad got in a pretty heated argument. I was playing outside at the time, and, and my, uh, my brother comes out and says, come on, we're leaving. And we walked something like seven miles back to my mom's house, and, and we never went back. For a few months after my parents divorced, my mom dated a few guys and, and even thought about marrying at, at one point. Um, and she didn't really talk to us about this, but I'm, I'm sure there came a point where she, she decided, I, I need to give up that dream and I need to focus on raising my boys. Um, I'm sure that was a really difficult sacrifice for her. Um, and, and she really did this so that she could dedicate herself to, to my brothers and my care. At the time, she was working as a respiratory nurse at, at, at a hospital, and she was working the overnight shift. My entire life, my mom worked the overnight shift. She would get some sleep during the day while we were away at school and, and be up, at, up in time to take care of us when we came home and into the evenings. 
Then she would leave us, uh, she would leave us about seven o'clock at night and, and head to work, leaving us home to go to bed and, and get ourselves ready for school the next morning. One of the cool things is uh, working overnights, this allowed her to be at almost all of our sporting events. My brother and I both were involved with, with basketball and track, and I remember one particular game. Uh, I was a freshman in high school. Yeah, that's me. Um, and uh, I remember after the game, I was, I was complaining to my mom. I was like, Mom, I want to go home on the, on the bus with my team. And... and, and uh, you know, they get to go to McDonald's. There's all that post-game chatter about how things went. And then just, you know, the girls' basketball team was on the bus too. And um, <laughs> a, a few years later and a, and, a, and a little bit wiser, I realized that, that my mom made every single one of my freshman basketball games. I don't know if any of you have been to a freshman basketball game. There's nobody there. You know, except primarily parents. And, and quite honestly, a lot of the parents that, uh, of my teammates couldn't be there either, whether it was for work schedules or, or family brokenness, or quite honestly, some of them just didn't have that much support. Um, so I look back at that, and, and I just I reflect going, my, my mom made sacrifices so that she could be here for me. And I did have the chance to, to thank her for that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I'm incredibly grateful for my mom's commitment to my brother and I, uh, and, and the sacrifices that she made so she could raise my brother and I the best that she could. And as I read about Hannah, I was reminded of this sacrifice that my mom made. Um, Hannah's life is mentioned only in 1 Samuel 1 and 2. It, it demonstrates a level of sacrifice that, that, like my mom's, is really hard for me to comprehend. In addition, she shows a tremendous amount of self-control in the face of a persecutor and a rival, an unwavering faith through her trials, and, and ultimately, she, she makes a, a sacrifice that's just unbelievable. Um, let's dig in and examine these together. If you have your Bibles, turn to, to 1 Samuel 1. Just for a little bit of context, uh, First and Second Samuel is set in Israel, in the years just prior to Israel's transition from being led by a judge to being led by a king. The events of 1 and 2 Samuel are estimated to take place uh, around 1085 to, to 970 BC, and this covers the birth the, and the ministry of Samuel through the appointing of Saul as, as, as Israel's first king in his reign, the rise of David and his, uh, his second kingdom, and concludes with the death of David, leaving the kingdom of Israel divided. Hannah is the mother of Saul, or I'm sorry, is the mother of Samuel, uh, and Samuel grew up in the service of the Lord. During Samuel's ministry, he was called by God to anoint Saul as Israel's first king, and then David as, as Israel's second. It's also worth noting that, that Samuel's sons, Joel and Abijah, were the last judges of Israel before, Saul anointed, or before Samuel anointed uh, Saul as the first king. Although the books key in on Samuel and the impact of his ministry, hence First and Second Samuel, uh, it starts with his mom, Hannah, praying faithfully and fervently in the face of torment. She dedicates her firstborn to the service of God, who richly blesses her faithfulness. Hannah's story is a key element in God establishing the royal line of David. God makes a covenant with King David that through his line, his reign would never end. It is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, our God, and our King. It's no accident then also that Hannah's song of praise also serves to foreshadow the song of Mary, mother of Jesus, as she raises Jesus knowing that he will be the sacrificial lamb who will take away the sins of the world. So let's read Hannah's account and see what we can learn from her. There was a certain man from Ramathium, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives, one was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of meat to his wife Penina and to her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed to Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. 
Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? So Hannah is the wife of Elkanah, but Elkanah has another wife, Penina. Hannah seems to be the preferred wife, but is barren, whereas Penina has children and seems very happy to let Hannah know about it. Notice, though, that Hannah's response is not to retaliate towards her rival. Instead, it says that she would weep and did not eat. As strange as it sounds, I can actually relate to her response. See, when I was in fifth grade, first day of school, I came back to a new school, met a kid on the playground at recess, and he took one look at me, recognized I was the biggest kid in school, and he comes up and asks me a question. Hey, want to fight? It's like, wh- 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 why? What? No, no thanks. Um, this continued kind of pretty much day after day, recess after recess for several months. Um, he would often be accompanied by a couple of his henchmen, I mean buddies. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> eventually he wouldn't take no for an answer. He tackled me, wrestled me to the ground. As the crowd gathered, he pulls up my shirt and teases me for being fat. Now, like Hannah, I didn't retaliate. I, I kept the peace there. I was just like, just let it go. But sadly, I also responded like Hannah in that I did stop eating. For the next couple of years, I would, I would eat maybe a bowl of cereal for breakfast, and I'd pack a, ba- a brown bag lunch to take with me to school. But if my mom didn't make dinner, I didn't make it for myself. I went from 5'10 and 155 pounds in fifth grade to 6'7 and 155 pounds in the ninth grade. And uh, just for a little bit of framing, um, I'm only two inches taller, and I've doubled that 155. (laughs) Okay? So, um, thankfully, you know, about eighth grade, I realized, man, I'm I'm hungry, (laughs) and and I want to gain weight. I started getting involved with, you know, football, basketball, and track, and and, and I wanted, well, I mean, just the activity alone made me eat like a horse. Um, But... It took a while for my metabolism to, to really stabilize, which it finally did. Um, and I will say this, to, to, my, to my bully, I never really did retaliate. What I chose to do was use that as motivation to be a better student and a better athlete. And I can't really say today where, where he's at. Uh, I do hope him the best. But I would say by the time we graduated high school together, it seemed like God blessed me for choosing the high road. My takeaway from Hannah for us today is this. When the haves make fun of the have-nots, don't retaliate. Take the high road. Let God work out his justice. We even see this stated clearly in Romans 12, 19. It says, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. As we look at Hannah and how she took the high road to Penina, Hannah also responded by leaning into God in prayer. Let's look at verse 9 through 18, and and we'll see this. Once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forgive your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor will be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Hannah's trial pressed her to pray, and pray, and pray, and pray. Years of prayer she spent on her knees, 
begging God to provide her a son. So much so and so fervently that Eli thought she was drunk. Now, I've been around Laura with a long time. I've been to a lot of prayer meetings. I've never mistaken someone for hitting the sauce at a prayer meeting. I'm not, I'm not throwing this out there as a challenge. To, but, but, I mean, that's, that's pretty intense if you ask me. Um, now, the thing is, like, Hannah also wasn't the first one in the Bible to, to wrestle with infertility. Hannah likely was very familiar with the childbearing challenges of Sarah and Abraham, Rebecca and Isaac, Rachel and Jacob. But Hannah's faithfulness and prayer and unwavering hope stand in contrast to Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel, who doubted, questioned, and even laughed at the notion of God providing them children. Instead, she responded to her plight by praying fervently to God with faith and with hope. And upon hearing Eli's blessing, she had complete confidence in his proclamation that that God would bless her. I know, too, that that my mom prayed fervently as well. Uh, As I said, when she had to leave for overnights, that would leave my brother and I alone at our house at age 8 and 11. You know, thankfully, we lived about 30 minutes from anywhere, but um, I just, you know, she told us years later, she would pray every time driving down our driveway that God would protect us and watch over us. And... um, This also, you know, helped to build some independent skills. You know, by the time we were early teenagers, we could cook and clean and do our own laundry, get ourselves up for school and living out in the middle of nowhere. My brother also was driving by the age of 13. Um, (laughs) But really, this thinking of back to Hannah, this this leads me me to our second takeaway is that um, let your hardships press you near to God. Let them press it near in prayer and faithful and anticipation of what God will do. When Hannah spoke to Eli and he blessed her prayers, we see that she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. This is an expression of confidence and faith. I'm surprised she's not mentioned in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11, although Samuel is, because Hannah demonstrates just what Hebrews 11:1 1 says in that faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about we, what we do not see. She was so confident, and she knew God would provide. She trusted God's word through Eli. And her countenance then changed from being downcast to being fully assured of God's answers to come. As we pick her story back up in verse 19, we see her prayers answered, and she does something, again, practically unthinkable. This would be like Anna and I getting pregnant and then going, you know, Eric, Francesca, I know you have two already, but here's one more. Can you make sure that they grow up and become the pastor of this church someday? (laughs) It's it's kind of mind-blowing. But the thing is, that's not the end of things. It's actually just the beginning. Verse 19, early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. Now, the the name Samuel can mean um, set or placed, presumably in the womb, or it can also mean uh, asked or borrowed from God. You kind of hear in in, in the meaning of his name the the, the journey that he's about to be uh, a part of. When her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. So about age eh, four, maybe. Do what seems best to you, her husband Elkanah told her. Stay here until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, Pardon, my Lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. So, so after years of persecution, which pressed her to years of fervent prayer, 
God answers her prayer, her prayer and provides her a son, Samuel. And what does she do next? She says, all I've been praying for, I'm giving back to God. But God wasn't done answering her prayers yet. See, God blesses Hannah and Samuel. When she dedicates him to the Lord, he took Hannah's sacrifice and blessed her abundantly, far above and beyond what she could have asked or imagined. He blessed her with five more children than she kept them this time. And God's still not done. He then blesses the life of Samuel, which I can only imagine from a mother's eyes had to make her incredibly proud and incredibly blessed. It was through Samuel that God guided Israel into a new era of its history. Samuel plays a key role in setting the scene for King David, that same King David through whose line the Messiah would be born, then sacrificed for the sins of the world three days later. He would be resurrected to bring about an everlasting hope, the forgiveness of sin, and the promise of eternal life. This same Jesus is our God, our Lord, and King on the throne for all eternity. My last takeaway from Hannah is this. Give back to God what he has given to you and watch as God blesses your sacrifice. You know, reality is, is that as creator of the universe, God owns it all anyway. There's nothing we can do that, that we can give to God that wasn't his and that, that, that he gave us already. So uh, now the ushers are going to come forward. We're going to take, take an off. No, no. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Not, not, not what I mean by this. What I believe God is saying here is this. There may come times in our lives when God calls us to make some form of sacrifice. At the time, it may even feel as significant as Hannah giving up her son. But when those moments come, take it to prayer and be ready to make that sacrifice. Again, whatever we offer to God as a sacrifice is his already anyway. We are only given things so that we can steward them. We will find in hindsight that whenever and whatever we've given back to the Lord, he blesses our sacrifice and uses it often in unforeseen ways, both for our benefit and to his glory. In all, in, in all honesty, this truth that we see over and over in scripture often makes me pause and ask, um, if we are certain of a better outcome when we make a sacrifice, is it really a sacrifice? That's a sermon for another day. Um, ultimately, here's, here's what I want to recap for us. Hannah was taunted by her rival, Penina. She took all, and in that, she took the high ground. When the haves make fun of the have-nots, don't retaliate. Throughout her trials, Hannah, Hannah responded with worship and faithful prayer and, in, and hopeful anticipation. So let your hardships also press near, you nearer to God and press near to God through prayer and that hopeful anticipation. When God provided a child, when he provided Hannah with Samuel, she then responded by giving him back to the Lord. And in that, God blessed her and, and used that for his glory. So give back to God what he has given to you and watch how God blesses your sacrifice. Reflecting back to my own mom and, and her boys, my brother Stephen and I, um, we didn't come from a tall family, but somehow we got really tall. Is that blessing, curse? I don't know. Um, but, but ultimately, though, we were both able to earn a, a full-ride scholarship, likely the only way either of us would have been able to afford going to college. In my brother's case, God blessed my mom as she saw my brother go into a faithful husband, father, coach. Um, and even recently, he started a, a widely successful fishing club in the middle school that he worked at for years, where unlike his years growing up, he sees fathers and sons fishing together constantly. In my case, God led me to become a faithful husband, father, youth pastor, and now serving as an elder here at Laurelwood. In my current work, I, I, I serve youth pastors and youth leaders around six states, uniting them in, in, in gospel-centered collaborative efforts to reach this generation of youth as I serve as the Northwest Coordinator for the National Network of Youth Ministries. I know my mom is proud of us. She's told us that. She tells us that often. But I have to say that I'm also proud of my mom for making 
a very significant sacrifice, and then many more to follow. I'm thankful that she, she chose the hard decision, lived for Jesus, prayed fervently, and made sacrifices to give my brother and I the best opportunity to succeed. So if my mom's watching, thank you. As I close, I want to reflect on Hannah's prayer in 1 uh, 1 Samuel 2 and Mary's song in Luke 46. I apologize, it's going to be small on the screen, but as you look at the screen in these two prayers, what you'll see is that there are some clear parallels between them. It is evident that Hannah's life foreshadows Mary's. Both women knew that their sons were not their own, but God's. They responded with a song of praise that emphasizes God's strength, justice, blessing, and promises. Only Hannah is near to the time that those promises are proclaimed, and Mary is a little bit closer to when they are fulfilled. I'd like to highlight that Hannah's prayer emphasizes God's promise to give strength to the king and exalt the horn of the anointed, whereas Mary's song recognizes that Jesus is that king, the anointed one of God. Both point to the the most extreme sacrifice of all, which we just celebrated in communion, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Unlike Hannah and and his mother Mary, Jesus knew full well what he was getting into. He knew that the sacrifice was coming. He willingly, in spite of that, chose to leave heaven, come humbly to this world as a baby, live a life surrounded by hardship, persecution, temptation, and yet without sin. He would be unjustly arrested, sentenced, beaten, and hung on a wooden torture device until he died, taking on his shoulders our sin, our shame, our judgment. And then God blessed. Jesus was raised from the dead. He conquered sin and death. He is on the throne in heaven today, forgiving all who call on him and preparing heaven for those who place their faith and trust in him. The day is coming when he will return and take his earthly throne. Then he, will return, then he will restore the heavens and the earth and reign on high forever. I want to encourage you today. If God is stirring in your heart and if you see this sacrifice of Hannah and ask yourself, why would someone do that? The answer is this. It's because, because we have a God who sent his son as a sacrifice, as a sacrifice for you. You see, we we are all created to have a relationship with God, and yet our sin is what separates us from him. Try as hard as we can, none of the the things that we can do, none of our good works can, can restore that relationship and take away that sin, and knowing that God willingly sent Jesus, his son, to pay the price and pay the penalty for us. And when you put your faith in Christ alone, he will forgive you, and he will welcome you into his family. And he will give you eternal life. And that eternal life can start today and last forever. As the worship team makes their way back up, if that is you today, I would love to talk with you. I, I, I'll be here after the service. I, w- I would encourage you to, our elders, our pastors, our ministry leaders, they too would love to talk with you, pray with you, answer any questions you have so that you too can start today a relationship with Jesus. Please find one of us after the service. As we near the end of our service this morning, I'd like to to close by praying for our offering. If you're here for the first time, again, your your welcome card is your offering. Um, you, You don't need to feel any obligation to give towards the ministry of our church. So let's pray.